Welcome, uh, everyone, for participating. Welcome to our Asian Impact webinar. Uh, uh, today's title is the Transforming Agriculture in Asia. Uh, we are happy to uh, have you on this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Um, we are joined with four panelists today. I will introduce, introduce them after the presentation. First, we'll have presentation about 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, we'll have discussions with panelists. Uh, please leave your questions uh, in, the, uh, in the QA box. And we will, I, will, I will read them. And then I will uh, the, uh, you, uh, ask your questions to the panelists uh, later on. So uh, uh, because our time is limited, so I'd like to start uh, with our presentation. Uh, the, the presenter today is um, a, uh, Manisha Pradhan Nagan uh, of ADB, an economist. Uh, so Manisha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Takashi. Um, let me share my screen. All right, thank you very much, Takashi. So my presentation um, today will be based on the Asian Development Outlook Update, theme chapter titled Transforming Agriculture in Asia, which was published in September. Um, so as uh, many of you may know, agriculture has played a critical role in Asia and Pacific's development. In the 1960s, most economies in the region were low income, primarily agrarian and struggling to feed their growing populations. Since then, development in agriculture have led to sharp rise in yields and incomes. This has also freed up labor, which has en enabled rapid structural transformation and emergence of the region's vibrant manufacturing and services sectors. One third of developing Asia's workers are still employed in agriculture, but the sector is beset by low productivity and incomes. This means that increasing productivity in the sector is critical for poverty reduction. Agriculture sector today in the region faces challenges from three ongoing shifts, changing demand, changing demographics, and a changing and more fragile environment. In this presentation, I will discuss each of these briefly. Okay, the first one is changing demand. In developing Asia, rising incomes and urbanization are altering food consumption habits. As the figure shows, total daily caloric intake per capita has increased and is expected to reach 2,844 kilocalories by 2030. Total calorie intake tends to reach a plateau at around 3,000 kilocalories, and some Asian countries are quickly reaching this level. Further, as incomes rise, what people consume changes. As you can see from the left panel, meat consumption in developing Asia is fast growing, although it remains below um, compared to advanced countries. In contrast, seafood consumption, the panel on the right, is already higher in Asia than in advanced economies, reflecting differences in consumption preferences. This shift in food preferences towards animal-based products will require more resource-intensive production. As you can see in the chart, animal-based products consume more resources and produce higher emissions than plant-based products. For example, beef generates the most greenhouse gases and has the biggest water footprint per kilocalorie consumed. In the last two decades, developing Asia has also made significant progress in reducing hunger by lifting more than 200 million people un from undernourishment. Despite this, various forms of malnourishment still persist. For example, more than half of the countries in the region suffer from above 20% prevalence in child stunting, with significant shares in both rural and urban areas. At the same time, obesity is increasing in many countries, especially in the Pacific. The second challenge comes from changing demographics. As young people outmigrate from rural areas, rural population is shrinking. In the first panel, the share of rural population, the red line, is declined from above 80% in the 1970s uh, to 50% in 2020, and is expected to decline further to below 40% by 2050. Outmigration has generally left the elderly and women behind to attend to agriculture. In the second panel, you can see the proportion of farmers aged 60 and above is about 70% in the Republic of Korea. In other Asian countries, the proportion is low at around 20%, but is expected to increase in the future. Existing data shows that feminization is particularly pronounced in some countries such as Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Nepal, where labor migration is high. 
there is a need to carry out detailed surveys and studies to understand the trends better. Um, despite this increase in responsibilities, however, women remain disadvantaged with limited access to agricultural resources, finance, and extension services. The third challenge relates to climate change and environmental degradation. Climate change poses ever greater risk to agriculture in Asia. For example, many parts of developing Asia have experienced significant changes in precipitation. Some areas have experienced reductions in precipitation, the areas in dark brown in the map, um, such as Northern Thailand, Myanmar, Northern Bangladesh, Southern India, etc., while other areas experience increased participation. This is the dark blue areas in the map. Extreme weather events such as droughts and floods are expected to become more frequent and damaging, heightening rural communities' vulnerability. In the same chapter, we also discuss other environmental issues in agriculture, such as overuse of chemical inputs and water stress. For example, as you see from the chart, over 90% of the estimated rural people globally under water stress are in Asia, although only 21% of the affected agricultural land is in this region. Climate change is expected to further exacerbate water shortages, while irrigation management, which played an important role in Asia's agriculture in the past, is facing structural challenges due to outmigration out of farmers. Some farmers have stopped farming altogether, leaving fallow plots in the middle of irrigation systems, while others have invested in private irrigation systems using pumps, ponds, sprinklers, thereby becoming independent of community irrigation management. To address these three challenges, the theme chapter recommends two sets of policies. The first group of policies are to support innovative practices and solutions on the farm. These include promoting a well-regulated aquaculture to meet growing demand for seafood, expanding access to machines for smallholder farmers, and improving technologies and practices for sustainable farming. The second group on the right um, are policies related to providing a comprehensive system to support agriculture production. These include investing in early warning systems and climate resilience infrastructure, hastening the development of national crop insurance schemes, and focusing agriculture policy away from production support and towards market-oriented and innovation-encouraging policies. I'll briefly discuss some of these policies today, um, but I hope that our experts will also share their ideas during the panel discussion. The first recommendation from the theme chapter relates to promoting well-regulated aquaculture to meet increasing demand for seafood. Aquaculture, the, uh, the parts in light green and dark green in the left panel, rapidly increased in the last two decades. In Asia, the, the dark green part dominated this expansion, accounting for about 90% of the world's aquaculture production. The PRC is by far the world's largest producer of farmed fish, followed by Indonesia, India, and Vietnam. Aquaculture has contributed to good nutrition and employment in Asia. However, environmental sustainability is a major concern, which requires careful, careful monitoring and effective regulation. The second recommendation that I discussed today relates to expanding access to machines for smallholder farmers. Use of farm machinery saves time and labor. For example, a single hour of combined harvester saves about 24 labor hours. Such labor-saving advances also enable older workers to prolong their careers. In the figure, the size of the circle represents the use of agriculture machines. The figure shows that the adoption of agriculture machinery increased over time, although at varied rates across economies. This has contributed to increased labor productivity. The circles are moving from left to right on the horizontal axis. Asia is home to 350 million smallholder farmers who have little access to capital, markets, or services. These farmers face critical constraints on the adoption of agriculture machinery. Innovative arrangements such as farm machine rental and services have emerged to help smallholder farmers to hire agriculture machine services in developing Asia. Finally, the last recommendation that I'll discuss today relates to investing in early warning systems, that use advanced spatial information systems combined with detailed crop models and ground data on agricultural production and management. These early detection, these systems um, detect extreme weather events early and can help farmers anticipate and plan accordingly. These systems can also help assess damages of such extreme weather events. For example, water stress and drought intensity can vary substantially across regions, and crude assessments may miss hotspots. Um, high resolution spatial analysis, like you see in the map, can more accurately assess damage and inform crop insurance programs, which we also discussed in the report. 
Finally, my, my last slide here is a link to the ADO update theme chapter. I've kept my presentation quite brief, but there's much more details in the theme chapter, and I invite you to download and read. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Manisha, for a uh, uh, nice, uh, nice presentation. Uh, very uh, nice summary of our theme uh, chapter. As Manisha mentioned, it, today's presentation is based on our thematic chapter in ADB's uh, most recent Asian Outlook uh, uh, 2021 update. So uh, as Manisha said, the more and details analysis, detailed analysis are included in the chapter. The chapter is available from ADB's uh, website. So thank you very much. So uh, today uh, we have uh, uh, four panelists. Um, I hope uh, you can see the panelists on, on the screen. Uh, so I will um, I introduce uh, four of them. So first we have uh, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Hughes. She is the general uh, director general of the International um, uh, International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, ICRISAT, based in Hyderabad in India. She's joining uh, from Hyderabad today. She is a, a biologist by training. She has worked in the UN, United Kingdom and Ghana at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IATA in Nigeria, the World Vegetable Centers, and International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Um, so uh, next to Jackie, uh, Jackie Hugh, uh, we have also uh, Dr. Sonia Akta. She is an assistant professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. Her research is situated on the nexus of agriculture, environment, and development in the Asia and Pacific region. She has worked extensively on agriculture and food policy, natural disasters, and women's empowerment in South and Southeast Asia. She is joining from Singapore today. Um, next, uh, we have Dr. David Dow. Uh, he is a senior economist and strategic strategy and policy advisor at the Regional Office of Asia and the Pacific of the FAO in Thailand. He worked previously for the Harvard Institute of International Development and again, International Research, Rice Research Institute. He has spent most of his professional career working on food policy uh, in Asia. Welcome, David. Finally, uh, we have uh, Dr. Eran Satoria Wan. Uh, he is an associate professor in the Department of Economics, Universitas Gajamada, uh, Gajamada in Jakarta, Indonesia. He is also chair of the policy working group, a policy think tank under the national team for the acceleration of poverty reduction, uh, which is under the office of vice president of Indonesia. So we are very fortunate to have uh, four, uh, uh, partic four panelists today. So um, I'd like to uh, start with Dr. Uh, Jackie Hugh, uh, uh, the Director General of the uh, ICRISAT. Uh, so uh, you have uh, extensive uh, experience working at the International Research Centers. And so could I ask uh, you about agriculture technologies and research now conducted at ICRISAT and probably other uh, international research centers. In particular, Manisha talked about cli climate change and this uh, the impact of the extreme weather events on the agriculture concerns uh, many people. So if you can touch upon on, on the issue, uh, that would be great. So Jackie, thank you. Thank you very much, Takashi. And building on Manisha's presentation, which was a very short presentation of what was a very heavy, interesting chapter. <clears throat> For us, the relative importance of climate change impacting food systems differs between regions. And there's no single solution to building resilience in our many food systems. There is climate change and that is driving the climatic events and those shocks. At ICRISAT, we focus on the dryland tropics where climate change can hit hardest, but where the greatest impact from interventions can be made. The drylands 
which many people forget, are, produce half the world's meat and half the world's grains. So we work on grain legumes, chickpea, pigeon pea, groundnuts, and dryland cereals, sorghum millets. These are very nutritious, nutritious crops that grow well in marginal dryland areas. In general, our cropping systems must work for the farmers as well as the consumers. For the farmers, the inputs, the different crops as part of a bigger cropping system, water management, pest diseases, soil fertility and income generation. Focusing a little more on the research that all the international and other centers do around agriculture, we need new climate adaptive, pest and disease resistant, more productive, more nutritious varieties, more quickly. Why? Because our changing environment will not, and our rapidly urbanizing and growing population cannot wait. The technologies that we have to hand include rapid generation advancement, marker assisted breeding, which can speed up the breeding process by up to 70%, and shortens the time to get hybrids and varieties to market. We have gene editing for addressing intractable problematic traits such as rancidity in pearl millet, parasitic weeds such as striga, where there's no sustainable source of natural resistance for Africa minimizing aflatoxin contamination, which affects my, many of the foods that we eat and affects markets. And that can be done through host-induced gene silencing. There are other forms of genetic manipulation, often less favorably re received by not only people, but by the government. These include oils such as canola oil, where there's high levels of nutritionally essential fatty acids, we can have longer shelf life tomatoes, wheat that doesn't include uh, gluten in the grain, rice with pro-vitamin A, the golden rice. So we have the technologies to make new varieties and deal with intractable problems. We also need to make sure that we look at our conserved material, the gene banks, whether for plants or for animals, and understand the genetic sequences because now the seeds are less important than the genome sequences, which we can then introduce into our crops using biotechnology. If we're looking at climate change, we can improve photosynthetic ability. We can improve water use efficiency. We can breed crops which will grow in temperature extremes. Sometimes we wonder if it's better to change crops than try and forcibly breed current crops that are adapted to a different environment to a changing environment. There are other technologies available to us um, to improve crop and food, food production. And why? Because we need to feed our increasing world population on the same amount of arable land. And that can include smart agriculture using precision agriculture, the satellite-based weather data you saw just now and the crop insurance, supply chain enhancements through blockchain certification using artificial intelligence, all of which will also help reduce losses. We cannot turn our backs on other game-changing technologies, not strictly agriculture, but lab-grown meat, cell-cultured seafood, animal-free cheeses, and more. These are no longer just in the lab. They've moved from the labs to supermarket shelves, with Singapore being the first country to approve cell-based meat products for consumption and putting into place a framework for regulating cell-based meats. So the meats, as we saw in some of the graphs in the chapter, have a major effect on methane emission, they are producing more methane, the cattle, for example, and affecting climate change. Another point is that policymakers need to be really proactive. They've got to track innovations that we make, put in place frameworks to support and manage the innovations in a future food system, a food system that sometimes we're imagining, we're dreaming, but it's becoming our tomorrow. 
These supportive policies are needed at a regional level as well as a national level because these problems don't stop at our country borders. And we need the policies to advocate game-changing technologies. So in summary, we've got to minimize risks to farmers. Farming is so risky and for, for the smallholders, a small climatic change can mean life or death. We need to assure food and nutrition security for the farming communities and for that hugely growing urban population who will not be growing the food. And finally, minimize the impact on the environment. We can't have further deforestation. We need to produce more food, more nutritious food on the same or less land. Thank you, Takashi. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much for nice, uh, important comment. Um, so the the audience, please put your comments, uh, questions in the QA sessions. I'm checking, so uh, I will ask uh, questions to Jackie uh, related to her, her, her comments uh, later on. Now uh, let me move to uh, Sonia uh, uh, Akta. Uh, so um, uh, Sonia, so um, thank you for joining today. So uh, you've been uh, working on um, uh, the. Uh, Besides uh, environments and, and, and agriculture, more focusing on the gender issues, and I'd like to ask questions on gender issues. <laughs> um, so in our reports, uh, we mentioned about um, feminization of agriculture, that the men are leaving rural areas and women are increasingly taking more responsibility, or you know, they have been working in agriculture, and we made that point. They have been working in agriculture, but it, it seems that they are taking more uh, responsibility but uh, what is your view on their uh, women's uh, changing responsibility? And they are, as, as you and others have pointed out, that are con constrained by the uh, uh, social economic uh, barriers in Asia. And, and particularly under the pandemic, uh, there may be the situation uh, may be changing. So um, I would like to ask your view uh, on the uh, women farmers. Thanks, Takashi. Thanks for the question. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Monisha pointed out that we are observing increased rate of feminization of agriculture in uh, South Asia particularly, and that uh, augmented women's roles and responsibilities, the time, amount of time they spend, as well as the kind of role they play in agriculture. And also Monisha pointed out that they face several challenges, but let me elaborate on three of the major challenges that women face. And then I'll talk about how these challenges intensified uh, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the first challenge, uh, or one of the most important challenges that women face in agriculture, performing their augmented role as a result of feminization and uh, labor, men, male migration out of agriculture is that women's work is unrecognized in most cases. And in cases when it's recognized is highly undervalued. Uh, so the unrecognized meaning that women are not recognized as farmers, although they spend a lot of time in agriculture and they play now more effective role in agriculture, but they are not considered as farmers. So that, that makes it difficult to perform their jobs effectively because it impairs women's access to resources, access to training, credit, information. And in situations when their work is recognized but highly undervalued, that means that women uh, face a gender wage gap in rural agriculture labor market. Uh, so data from Philippines, India, and Indonesia suggests that women earn as much as 25% less than male uh, laborer in the agriculture labor market. So this difference in uh, rural agricultural wage can be because women do different tasks and the tasks that women perform are considered less productive, less valuable. And also in many instances, men and women perform different tasks, but women get paid less because it's perceived that women are not as productive or don't perform the job as effectively as men. So these are, these are the challenges that women face in terms of getting their contribution recognized and valued. 
The other challenge, second most important challenge women face is that it's time poverty. So although as uh, you know that women's con contribution responsibilities increased in productive work, but their responsibilities and time use for reproductive work has not diminished. Uh, so women are, because of gender norms and in many rural Asian societies, uh, particularly in South Asia, uh, women's uh, also the gender division of labor dictates that women should perform uh, you know, a lot of household responsibilities like cooking, cleaning, collecting water, food, caring for children, caring for elderly uh, uh, members of the households. So all of these uh, responsibilities remain in place when while women's responsibilities for agriculture and the time is for agriculture and productive work has gone up. So data and evidence, which is collected from very detailed time use surveys in South Asian countries, as well as various Southeast Asian countries, suggests that women's time poverty has gone up over the past few years. And the third major challenge women face is gender asset gap. So this is also something very widely known. And uh, there is data emerges from very many different countries and the evidence is consistent, which suggests that women don't own asset in most cases. And whenever they own asset is very, very little compared to the male member of their household. Uh, so this gender asset gap uh, makes it very difficult for women to access credit and also make decision about land because oftentimes women don't have their names on the land title. Now, this was the situation in general, even before the COVID-19 pandemic struck. But as you are aware that whenever there's a crisis, the existing gender differences exacerbate because the crisis usually you know, makes things worse uh, for women. We have witnessed this in previous, in times of previous crisis, like previous uh, health, public health crisis, as well as due, during the financial crisis, and the 2007-8 food price crisis. So women's uh, paid employment opportunities have gone down because they face increased competition from the return migrant, migrants who return from overseas or migrants who return from other parts of the country because uh, seasonal work employment opportunities have gone down. Also after lockdown, many urban residents return to their rural roots because their work opportunities in urban areas have been curtailed due to the movement restriction. Women's unpaid family uh, work burden also gone up because in many uh, agrarian rural societies faced intense labor shortage due to the movement restriction. So these uh, women had to step up, step in to fill the labor shortage and as unpaid family worker. Their, their reproductive work time use for cooking, cleaning also has gone up quite substantially because of the return migrants. So uh, time use for water collection, food preparation, fuel collection have gone up quite substantially. This is from the evidence that emerged in the aftermath of the COVID uh, outbreak. Also gender asset gap widened. So whatever small asset women own, whether that's poultry or livestock or small jewelries, evidence suggests that women's asset gets liquidated first in the, uh, when the crisis hits because women feel that they are responsible for protecting their households from any kind of uh, adverse shock or, or effects of the shock. So they try to smooth out consumption uh, during good times and bad times, and they end up liquidating their assets first. And as a result, the gender asset gap becomes wider and, wider and women becomes more poor than they were actually were before the pandemic. There are other also effects that shows that uh, you know, gender-based discrimination in intra-household resource allocation also exacerbates when there is a shock. So as a result, women face higher food insecurity, uh, women and, and girls face higher food insecurity as well as higher uh, access to household resources for education, healthcare, and uh, uh, like non-food uh, items. 
So this is just a summary of the most important impacts, gender differences that women uh, experience in general and uh, how these uh, gender differences widened in the face of the COVID-19. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure there will be questions on uh, gender related issues. And so um, uh, we will come back to some of the very interesting, important uh, points. Uh, let us move on. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, David, David Dow. Um, so, um, uh, so under the pandemic, especially in recent years, the uh, food price inflation uh, has been, um, you know, picked up by the news and mentioned. And during the pandemic also, there has been some uh, disruption in the supply chains, increase of uh, oil price, which uh, or, uh, contributed maybe the inflation. Um, I think the, the first thing to note is that the uh, pandemic led to a dramatic slowdown in economic activity. And we saw negative GDP growth in, in most countries in the region. Um, and the few that didn't have negative growth still experienced a big slowdown. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was substantial concern that food supply chains would suffer um, serious problems and break down, either due to precautions to prevent the spread of the virus or because of export restrictions imposed by countries. But in the end, um, international trade uh, did quite well. Um, total merchandise exports declined by about 8% in 2020. Um, and, and the initial forecasts were much, much worse than that. Um, and, and agricultural exports actually increased by 1% in 2020. So food supply chains in particular seem to do okay at that level. In terms of policies, there were some restrictions, um, rice export restrictions um, on rice from Vietnam and Myanmar and Cambodia. Uh, but Thankfully, those were uh, not very strong restrictions and they were very short-lived. Um, now, a few months after the start of the pandemic, um, starting in May of 2020 now, um, FAO's International Food Price Index went up for 12 consecutive months in a row. Um, but despite that, the level of the index in October of 2020, so that's about 10 months after the pandemic began, it was just about the same as it was in December 2019. Um, the, food, the FAO's food price index didn't really start to increase until after October. And that strongly suggests that it wasn't really being driven by the pandemic um, because by that time, countries had had a, a fair chance to adjust to things. And in fact, there were many other factors going on driving the, the big rises in prices. There was bad weather and drought in the United States. There was drought in, in South America, leading to delays in planting and exposure to frost. Um, there were also demand side factors. Um, China was rebuilding its hog herds um, after African swine fever. And so that was um, adding to demand for, for maize and also wheat. Um, and then we also had rising oil prices, which increases the demand for biofuels which puts upward pressure on prices like maize and sugar. So there were many, many different reasons um, other than COVID why prices were going up. There, one factor that did was COVID related is there were a lot of shortages of migrant labor on oil palm plantations in Malaysia. Um, and, and this seems to have had some effect on oil palm production and, and, and helped to drive up international palm oil prices. Um, but generally speaking, it was, um, supply chains did reasonably well. As a result, uh, domestic food prices, the FAO food price index, by the way, is an index of international market prices. It's not the prices that consumers pay. Um, if you look at domestic food prices um, in countries in the region, they have been relatively stable um, since the pandemic began. So across 40 countries in the region, um, the real increase in food prices had a, had a median increase of just 2%. Um, so half the countries were less than 2%, half were more than 2% um, between December 2019 and December 2020. Um, peak year-on-year -year food price inflation has been well below the uh, levels experienced in 2008. 
um, during the food price crisis, and e even even below other other peaks in the last couple of decades. Um, since the end of 2020, uh, domestic food prices have still kind of largely remained under control. As, as just one example, between December 2019 and June 2021, um, real food prices actually declined in both China and India, the, the two biggest countries in the region. I think a big factor in keeping domestic food prices stable and under control has been collaboration between public and private sectors. Uh, many of the movement restrictions have certainly caused problems. There's no doubt about that. But many governments really work closely with the private sector, I think, to solve problems as they arose and make sure that they didn't last for long and keep food supplies flowing. So I think the, the countries did a really good job that way. Um, Nevertheless, the income shocks, if we, if we think about those, really led to serious increases in people suffering from undernourishment. Um, FAO estimates that the number of undernourished in Asia and the Pacific increased last year from 322 million to 376 million people, an increase of more than 50 million, most of which was, was, most of which was in Southern Asia. And, and now an estimated 1.1 billion people in Asia and the Pacific um, experienced severe or moderate food insecurity in 2020, which was also a very big increase on 2019. Um, right now, supply chains are experiencing some difficulties as consumers have increased spending um, in, in, in favor of physical goods and away from services like tourism. And so what that means is there's a lot more goods being transported around the world now than there were before. Um, so going forward, as vaccines become more common and, and widespread, hopefully spending patterns will shift back to more towards services, and this will help to relieve some of the pressure on supply chains that deliver physical goods like food. So I'll just stop there for now. Thank you, Takashi. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. So uh, toward the end, you mentioned about food security and nutrition and you know, increased number of uh, undernourished uh, children. So Eram, so uh, he has been uh, working uh, in Indonesia. Um, so uh, so you know, in your research, uh, uh, you have uh, studied um, you know, cash transfer programs to the poor people in Indonesia and food assistance programs. And um, so um, you are also the, the, the chair of the policy working group on the accelerating uh, policy poverty reduction. So based on your experience in Indonesia, could you uh, mention about, talk about that, uh, you know, uh, poverty reduction, uh, malnourishment uh, in Indonesia and, and beyond? Uh, okay, thank you Takashi for the question. Uh, and, and I think I, I'd like to congratulate for uh, ADB uh, for uh, launching this report, which is actually, actually it's quite uh, uh, on time and quite relevant with the current situation. And if uh, so, I like I like to to share my view actually on the link between the the what what we have been doing actually on the uh, reforms of the agriculture sectors in Asia, including Indonesia, and, and the implication uh, uh, to the uh, welfare status of the, of the poor and, and vulnerable in Indonesia, including their, their nutritional status. Uh, uh, we, 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 we conduct uh, many years uh, uh, the analysis that shows the, the, the strong link between the importance of the uh, agricultural sectors uh, to the uh, livelihood of the poor and of number, not just from the uh, from the from the channel between uh, the livelihood of the poor and the vulnerable with the uh, provision of the employment, particularly in the rural and uh, rural areas and agricultural sectors, but also on the provision of the of, uh, food. Uh, affordable food and uh, food security, uh, nutritional food security. Uh, in, 
we, I think we, we have like a consistent uh, results, consistent evidence that among the poor and then uh, the vulnerable groups that like about 60% of the uh, Indonesia uh, poor and then vulnerable household, uh, that there's 60% of the monthly budget, uh, they, they spend actually for the, for the food. Uh, so it is quite significant uh, proportion. So if anything happened actually with the availability of the food, anything happened with the price, definitely it has, it will have the implication, uh, negative implication to the livelihood of the poor and, and, and food reports. Uh, so that is one. The second one, uh, the, there's also strong link of the, between the agriculture and then uh, the, the, the life, the, the livelihood of the poor. And, and vulnerable to so the uh, how the, the agriculture sector, particularly the food uh, security, nutrition and food security, with the situation of the malnutrition in Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia until like 2018, uh, I think one of the country in Asia with the like highest uh, prevalence of the stunting, like a 37%. We manage uh, to decline uh, to uh, to push down the the prevalence of the stunting under five years old in the last uh, three four years. Uh, now in two thousand one, we just uh, we just uh, uh, release uh, the government just released the the stunting rate uh, the the newest stunting rate like by twenty four point four percent compared to like uh, two thousand thirteen when we still have the prevalence like in the 37.2%. Uh, and this is definitely linked between the, uh, with the, the, the situation uh, in the uh, uh, food uh, uh, security, uh, food availability, food access, as well as the price. Indonesia perhaps uh, particularly among the poor and vulnerable are among uh, the country in Asia that their consumption of the protein source is the, the lowest. Uh, and uh, and I still, it's, still, it's still like that uh, until now. But this is not just, uh, uh, this is just one, one side of the coin. The other side of the coin uh, is also because uh, that, that's related with the knowledge and then the awareness because Malnutrition, particularly stunting, we found also uh, like a significant number are among the the, the, the top 60% of the population. So, the, so stunting in Indonesia is not just a problem in the uh, among the poor, the bottom 40%, but also like uh, the top 60%. So government uh, recognizing this problem, government has been uh, uh, pushing, has been trying to address actually the situation through like a different sets of interventions. And the in the area of the poverty reduction, government like uh, launch uh, like program like CCT that uh, we we conduct like impact evaluation of the CCT like in uh, four five years ago, and it indeed the, the CCT uh, one of the intervention one of the main program in Indonesia that uh, significantly can reduce uh, the uh, uh, stunting uh, among the Indonesia population. The other program, the social protection program that also now uh, proved to be uh, successful in improving the consumption of the source of the protein is the, the food voucher. This is the, pro the new program, uh, which is uh, tra uh, transition, which is, uh, 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 this is the originally actually like a, a subsidized rice program. But since 2016, 2017, the government decided this to uh, to change the program to like a food voucher that enable the poor and then vulnerable, the beneficiaries of the program to access or to, to purchase uh, uh, other food uh, commodities other than uh, rice. And the, the impact evaluation of the program shows that uh, the program indeed uh, actually increased the, the access of the poor and vulnerable, which is the beneficiary of the program to the different source of the protein uh, uh, last year, we we saw the from our, our impact evaluation that the the, the consumption of the uh, X is actually increased, and based on that, then government uh, just last year in 2010 and 2020 
uh, expand actually the, the food commodities uh, within the program that can be purchased by the poor. So I stop there, uh, Takashi. Thank you, Aaron, for the interesting and findings at the end. Um, so, um, so that's great. Um, so we have um, about uh, 15 minutes. Thank you, everyone, to keeping the, the time short. Uh, I have, we have uh, many questions. And so uh, let us um, start with the, uh, the, the Miran's uh, questions. He asked, do the panelists have view on gender sensitive approaches to agriculture extension and other services uh, to uh, narrow the gender gap? And uh, related in terms of the extension and research, the Hans uh, has uh, questions that about the funding of the international research. And you know, uh, in the past, that uh, international research has proven uh, to be uh, productive, uh, have uh, great returns. But uh, as many of us know, the, the funding has uh, declined, and it's very difficult. And and the Jackie is in the middle of this, so uh, I would like to invite Jackie to comment on the gender issue, extension, and also the, the funding issue. Okay, thank you, Takashi. That's quite a handful. But to look at the gender aspect, uh, I'm not a gender specialist, and Sonia gave me a lot of ideas, but one thing we need to do is to actually ask the women what they want. Many of the researchers are not women, and sometimes I find that Project proposals that we submit have gender right at the end as an add-on, and you can maybe move it up one paragraph. And why is that? Because many of the writers of the proposals probably are men. Um, we've got to be careful not to give women extra work. If you make some machinery more amenable to women, well, they've got to do that as well as everything else. And that was mentioned. Um, Moving on a little bit, the legal ability to access, for example, financing doesn't mean that the women know actually how to do it. So we need some help at that level for the women so that the gender is more equal. And then funding, as we move on to that, because extension and funding, to me, kind of go together in the sense that extension is often a national responsibility. The percentage of GDP spent on agriculture and research and extension is very low. And for the funders, including the multilaterals that you referred to, the biggest problem is that the funders, the donors, all need to show impact either to their boards or their governments. Research takes a long time delivery of a product through extension can take a long time, even if it's something as useful as digitized extension. The ability to articulate and deliver not only the return on investment in terms of numbers, but the pictures, it's really tough for research. So that's just my take from a research point on those questions, Takashi. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jackie, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sonia, I, I saw you uh, uh, reacting to Jackie's comment. Um, and also we have uh, a, co a question from uh, uh, Marek uh, and questions uh, that, that uh, so um, gen, gen wage and asset gap. Um, so he's mentioning, uh, you can tell us something very uh, gender related differences in South Asia and Southeast Asia. I know this is also uh, the UI uh, expertise, uh, Sonia. So uh, could you uh, uh, talk about difference in the gender uh, issues in South Asia and Southeast Asia? Uh, right, yeah, thanks. So before I answer the second question, let me just give an uh, evidence of the first question that one of the audience has asked is whether uh, we can, there is gender sensitive approaches to increase women's participation or access in extension services. So I was part of a program uh, in Timur Leste, which was funded by the uh, Aus uh, Australian uh, Agriculture International Agriculture Research Center. And evidence from that program suggests that gender specific targets, program targets, actually enhances women's access to extension services. So this is a research that I have done based on the 
you know, the, the way the program was implemented and how the program set a target of gender, uh, women beneficiaries in the program, and then how that made the extension agents reaching out to more female farmers and then being uh, and extending the extension services to these uh, female farmers. So that's about the first question. Answering the second question about differences between uh, gender roles and gender uh, women's empowerment in agriculture in South Asia and Southeast Asia. My research and experience of working in this region for over the last 10 years suggests that there's a very big difference in South versus South Asia versus Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asian countries like Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, uh, Indonesia, we found that women are more empowered. Uh, women have more decision-making power. Women have more access to uh, resources, training, agricultural credit, and information and, and knowledge compared to women in South Asia. So it's uh, in, in South Asia, women's uh, autonomy as well as women's uh, decision-making power, control over resources and access are much lower. Uh, so in South Asia, Southeast Asia, we found that even in some instances, we found women are more empowered than men, uh, which is a big contrast in South Asia. Okay, uh, Sonia, thank you. So, so Jackie, Sonia, uh, thank you very much. Um, so there are some uh, uh, interesting questions. Um, so let's pick uh, Warren's question um, uh, on the, um, the community. Uh, uh, so, okay. Can the panelists also comment on the impact of the commodity crunch uh, created by the COVID-19 pandemic on agriculture? Will the impact uh, farmers will this impact farmers' decision on what to plant? And and so, um, David, do you want to come in? Sure. Yeah, I can. I can say something uh, on that, Takashi. I think the yeah the. The analysis that that I've seen and and the changes in prices suggest that there hasn't really um, been a big um, commodity crunch created by COVID nineteen. Um, in fact, in many ways, I mean, there was some back migration to uh, agricultural areas due to the pandemic, as people lost their jobs in urban areas and especially in service oriented um, sectors. Um, and so, I think I think agricultural production has held up pretty well with, with a couple of exceptions, like I mentioned um, with the, um, when, when, when agriculture relies on migrants from other countries, and then there's some movement restrictions there that, ca that cause problems, but, but hopefully we're getting towards the, the end of those. I'd also like to just add something briefly, if I could, about the, uh, the gender. I think um, uh, following on from what uh, Sonia said, the, the research that I've seen actually suggests that in Southeast Asia as well, that agriculture is not really becoming feminized. It is in South Asia, but, but in what we see in, in urban areas in, um, in Southeast Asia is bigger proportions of women than there are in the overall population. So that you've got a lot of, a lot of women maybe related to what she was just saying, that they tend to be more empowered. Um, that that sometimes they do that and, and leave and and leave urban and leave rural areas. So we don't want, you know. I think it's important to be aware of all these things, um, and and that speaks to the importance for doing research on these issues. Uh, um, and I couldn't agree more with what Jackie said about about how to improve the gender situation. Is is ask ask women what they need. <laughs> you know, they'll tell you. We don't need to sit here and theorize about it. Um, you know, ask them what would be helpful to them. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. And then that, the, the people who ask questions should be women researchers. And then I, we want to see more women researchers coming in this area. Um, so there is one question about the Philippines, about the job losses because of what bad weather. Um, so, uh, you know, the number mentioned is very large, but, you know, it is general, uh, the bad weather in agriculture and, and floods and so on, so may cause uh, job losses. In some extreme cases, uh, uh, you know, push uh, families in the remote areas to, to move out from the area searching for better place. So um, this may continue, but uh, does anyone wants to 
comment on that uh, or can I invite any uh, panelists to talk about there's another question about CBID. If anyone is familiar with CBID, uh, you can answer. So we are running out of time. So if if uh, no uh, volunteers, um, so uh, so can I? Uh, I will uh, move on to uh, uh, next question. But in in general, the, this you know the the, the climate change uh, and some some extreme weather impacts. Uh, have uh, otherwise uh, uh, impact. So as uh, in our report, uh, we discussed, and also as uh, Manisha mentioned, in Asia, the, the, the population density along the rivers uh, is, is very high. So uh, the, the, the flood in, in the less populated area, flood in populated area causes uh, you know, different magnitude of uh, impact. So, um, so that needs to, uh, so that there's a high, high, high uh, need for uh, protecting such area and providing assistance. And we in our, um, our reports, we talked about the importance of early warning systems, especially early warning systems with the additional help, for example, providing shelters, providing cash, is cash in before the, uh, the, uh, the coming uh, events to, to help the uh, likely Population uh, who be affected by the by the floods and so on. So, so um, and then this is same for the floods, same for the drought. So the importance of early warning and also after the events, the uh, crop insurance uh, is also important. And many countries are adapting, and the private sector, public sector collaboration is taking place. And in these areas, both um, early warning systems and crop insurance systems. In now the uh, advanced spatial information systems using satellite images and AIs and algorithms uh, uh, help to identify areas which are likely to be affected by the by these events and also um, uh, identify areas who are affected and then help the uh, you know crop insurance uh, uh, providers to verify the claims and provide uh, um, the benefits uh, in a short time. So uh, such a discussion is in the report. So please check the reports and, and then I will be happy if you uh, really uh, read the report. And, and if you have any comments, please let us know. Uh, I thank you very much for uh, raising questions and thank you for the panelists uh, for coming today. Uh, this has been very interesting and important event. Um, so I'd like to now um, uh, make announcements, uh, advertisement for the next uh, uh, Asia Impact uh, webinar, which is on the December 14th, same time to, to 3 p.m. And next time, it, uh, the, uh, our uh, Sinyon Park uh, director of one of our division will discuss strategic uh, routes for financial resilience in a ASEAN plus three. So uh, please come back to our in Asia Impact webinar. So thank you very much. I see 132 participants. Thank you, every one of you for participating. Thank you, uh, panelists, uh, Jackie, Sonia, David, and Eran for participating. Manisha, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you next time.